<laughs> it's not my field. I'm not a neurosurgeon. So you'll be this is a good seat for uh, for disappointing you. And so I'm really, really sorry. What is what she's gonna record this, so I don't know how it's gonna turn out. And of course I gave this talk before, but I had to rearrange it a bit. Um, so the speakers today should have talked uh, about deep brain simulations in I believe in Parkinson's disease and how this um, kind of um, affects language. The reason why I'm talking so slowly is because I hope <laughs> to see it every time. <laughs> this is not happening. So I think I'm getting ahead for this. So, what I thought um, I should really give you, I mean, if you can hear perhaps you're either interested in language or you're interested in Parkinson's disease. Um, so, I'm going to go through with you on the functional anatomy. Of, of these frontal striatal circuits, and why, for example, these Parkinson's disease, these subcortical disorders, at some point have some impairment of higher cortical functions, like, for example, language or behavior. Is that good enough? Yeah. Right, so, okay. So, when we talk about Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is one of the um, incredible. Um, useful model because it was one, if not the first, neurotransmitter model of disease. You do have a, the story goes the following they found these changes in substantia nigra that are quite evident. So that is the normal one, and that is the pathological. So substantia nigra means black substance, and when that regenerates, you have less of that. So, uh, people start looking at that region in the brain and start extracting the neurotransmitters. So, they say, well, actually, this is a neurotransmitter pathology. We're going to replace with the result in the 1960s, and that the people are going better. These models, what we try to apply to disorder or cognition, like, for example, um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, that didn't work. So we thought it was um, cholinergic, neurotransmitter uh, deficit in, in memory problems. Then we gave an anticholinesterase inhibitors. Um, so cholinesterase inhibitors that increase uh, the uh, acetylcholine transmissions. But actually, we know that these drugs don't work in Alzheimer's disease. So, so far, this remains the best example of a neuro single neurotransmitter disease. That was the story until uh, a few years ago when actually we started looking at other neurotransmitters and we realized that actually there is something going on in addition to dopamine deficit in Parkinson's disease. So when we looked at the, um, at the images, so we had someone that comes with Parkinson's disease signs, and for those of you that are not familiar with the disorder, usually it's a triad of the three symptoms. <laughs> the first, the most obvious one, is tremor. And that usually is unilateral on one side, and it usually affects the hand rather than the, the, the feet. Um, the second is um, this um, slowing of movement, what we call bradykinesia. So usually the person says, well, actually, I'm a bit slower doing it. When I, when I cut, I can't do it. And they usually actually are the family, the relatives that say, I know this dad and mom, that they're always sad. But actually, it's not that they are sad. Their um, facial expression is simply reduced because of this general uh, slowness movement. The third aspect is the rigidity. So when you're actually trying to move their arms, it will be like, like this. Okay, so they're a bit rigid. We think Parkinson's disease, like John Paul II, they used to, you know, shake a lot. But actually, about 40% of Parkinson's disease had no evident tremor. So, it mixed up with the other two. Okay? Uh, so, when you have someone coming to your clinic with a, 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 a symptoms, you may or may not request 
uh, a CT scan and an MRI scan. The reason why we are progressive in an MRI scan is usually to exclude secondary disorders. And sometimes we might find osteoencephalitis lesions, which are Parkinson's disease that follow uh, a, a brain infection which affected the substantial media on both sides, like in this case. Yeah? But that the intensity, that is hyper intensity due to that lesion of substantial media. Sometimes you have, like, like those images that are that sort of like T1 and T2, but not, they are perhaps on one side only. Um, so these are different examples. And the reasons why perhaps in the future we might be able to actually do the MRI scan and look and measure the Sansa Negra. I don't know whether you can see it, but it's just visible there. You can see that, that kind of line, very dark. Well, you can't really tell from a single scan whether that is normal or pathological. So that's the first use of imaging in Parkinson's disease. That is a sort of a, the usual kind of a, um, diagrams that people use to explain. So one of the things about the laser gun here is that actually they communicate with the frontal cortex all the time through these loops a cortical to cortical plan cortical again. So from the from the um, cortex um, from the cortex, uh, the first projections go to the cortex, and it goes forward on the cornic and putamen. They together form this striatum. So cornic and putamen together form the striatum. And that's why the first limb of this sit is called the frontal striatum. Okay? And then from the striatum, there are kind of a direct and incorrect loops passing through. Um, the external pallidum, the internal pallidum, and some of them to this uh, um, subthalamic nucleus. But all those kind of uh, pathways convert to the thalamus, and the thalamus relates back to the cortex. And what you have to remember is that the cortex is blind, it doesn't receive any sensory information directly. So all the information that the cortex receives about the external world is whispered into his ears by the thalamus. So the thalamus is really the advisor to the king. That is true for all the sensation except one. I can ask my students, should we know about this? They're out of contact. That is true. That's the only um, sensory pattern that doesn't really go through the thalamus. Okay? And it goes back to um, same cortex, but also um, different cortex. Now, so if we can't use structural imaging, perhaps we can use other type of imaging, like PET spec is that where you actually measure the metabolism of the dopamine. For example, like in this case, healthy and the dopamine, we're measuring dopamine uh, metabolism on the basal ganglia, on the strand. So you see, bilateral, you may have a reduction on one side, and that's quite typical of Parkinson's disease. Asymmetrical reduction. This is the same, this is the same, that's the same. Okay? Now, before when I do my clinic and I see patients with Parkinson's disease, I don't request that kind of scan. Because what you do, you do your clinical examinations, you do your diagnosis, and put them on medication. And if they respond to have Parkinson's disease, sometimes, so most of the time, they don't even request an MRI scan. So why should we request those kind of um, imaging? Because, and that is an important study that came out weeks ago, if you use these uh, um, neurology methods to measure and quantify the loss of dopamine on the basic area, 
you can stratify your Parkinson's disease group into four groups, with the Q1 is the one with worse deficit. So Q1 is a fairly big, lower uh, centile. Then you have a, a second group, the less deficit, and Q3, and, and group one is actually, the, I think it's the control. Or it's actually the one that I'm not very dissimilar from the controls. Now, the people that have a very, do you have a, so the people that had really a significant reduction in dopamine metabolism are at risk of motor um, consequences derived from motor problems, like for example, falling. Okay, the risk of falling is two times higher in people that have the worst deficit. Compared to other people, for example, that, that are not so bad in terms of dopamine deficit. The same is true for postural instability, for example. Look at that. Or the spike time. But what really is more significant is the risk of no motor um, problems, like complications, like cognitive impairment. So if you have Parkinson's disease and dopamine levels, are very low, you have uh, um, eight, seven, eight times um, greater probability of developing dementia compared to people that have kind of a, don't have that significant deficit. The other thing is also, it's true here, it's psychosis, look at that, 12 times. And perhaps the fresh, but less significant. So what does it mean? It means that dopamine, perhaps, is doing something else. Not only is important for movement, but also for cognition and thought processing. So, and that is not a surprise, because this feedback, they don't go on, only to motor premotor cortex, but also to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that is important for executive functions, memory, but also orbital frontal, which is important for emotions and behaviour. Right. <clears throat> the second, uh, uh, second actually reason for doing this is actually that Dopamine is one of the, uh, the neurotransmitters, but also there's another transmitter that is pathological, which is called a cholinergic uh, transmission. And in fact, if you have a Parkinson's disease, plus dementia, not only your dopamine levels are impaired, but also your cholinergic. So now we're treating this disorder as a not only dopaminergic disorder, but also multi neurotransmitter disorder. The other thing that you have to remember is that actually the disease progresses. It starts off as a subcortical structure, but then becomes gradually more cortical. And according to the stages of Bruck, you have a, about six stages. And the first stage is the dorsal Motor nucleus of vagus, rapid nucleus, and locus cerulis. Now, these are all important nuclei for visual, uh, vegetative kind of functions. So, the premotor phase of Parkinson's disease is very difficult to catch. Hyperosmia, so the sense of smell changes. And unless you are kind of a um, you are very good with it, or you like your wine, or you like your cheese, it's very difficult to say, well, actually, my smell has changed. And that changes anyway with age. So, uh, constipation is nothing, it's very typical. Or just like hypertension, which means when they stand up, they feel a bit like headed, dizzy. Then, depression, again, sometimes depression. 20, 30 years before Parkinson's disease. 
um, articular pain and fatigue. Now, these are very, very generic symptoms. It's very difficult to spot them. So, um, but that is sort of the pre-model phase. Then, after a few years, <clears throat> and this stage could actually last for years, not just months. After that, you have a clinically evident Parkinson's disease. This is where patients can come to you, and if you have a driving pain meter, rigidity, tremor, and postural instability. That's again, so three to six years, you already are eight to ten years of disorders, and that's because the degenerations um, is actually affecting more grossural uh, areas like the substantia nigra. And then you go into the Parkinson's disease with complications, where actually you have a memory impairment, dysphagia, so pneumonia, this is quite late. It's late disorder, acute delirium, nocturia, and you have a, a lot of other common problems, like language problems, for example, or executive problems. And that's because you have now the disorder that is affecting cortex as well. Okay? So, um, and by the way, I'm not going to make it last long, so perhaps another 10 minutes and then we all go. Um, now, there are two types of Parkinson's disease. One is the sort of the, the early one, the one that actually where you can see all those stages I've talked to you, and uh, the, the, the hallmark disorder is a, is a, it's called the Levy body. Levy bodies um, that are this inclusion in, in, in the neural cells. And um, yes, it's Levy body, it's not a new body. Uh, and the reason is, uh, how do you call it? Lewy body or Levy body? I used to call it Lewy. Then I went to this talk by a good friend of mine, Professor Rob Howard. You were there, weren't you? Stephen was there. <coughs> Remember that? You were there at the talk? So, so Rob Howard is Professor of All Day Psychiatry. And uh, he, in his department, when I started, I started in his department, and, um, and he's, very, he's a peculiar uh, man, but anyway, he finished his talk, and there was a guy, a student, asked him, Professor, I can't remember the, talk, the question, but it was about the Lewy body are certainly, and he stopped him and said, oh, I, first of all, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say Lewy, that he was German, he was called Levy, and he went to the United States, and for some sort of a um, reason, he was changed to Levy, and it was also spelled wrong when he wrote, they wrote it down. So they would call it Louis, because it's sort of a, um, you know, it's a bit racist, and accent, uh, kind of a, and poor guy went like that. So, <laughs> went. So, don't, so let's call it Levy bodies, yeah? Levy bodies, they accumulate brainstem first, stage one and two. And then they accumulate substantia nigra and then the cortex, etc. But in the old age, you might have someone that actually really presented to you with all the stages together. And that's because in the old age, you have the Parkinson's disease, plus a bit of vascular problems, lesions, plus a bit of aging. All together, it will come to you already demented. Okay? That's why it's very hard um, to deal with the subject in when, it, when the, the, the onset is later in life. Now, how to spot, how to help the conditions, uh, how to map these lesions that may affect um, these high cognitive functions? Well, one way is to follow it, is to call the CHIT scale, Cholinergic Capacity High Brain Intensity Scale. So what they've done, they took an atlas of the cholinergic pathways in the human brain. It was done by Meslin Group, Standard 
first. And you can see that actually the cholinergic system is not only on the minor nuclei, but actually it goes all in cortex. So this is a, all the cholinergic system. And what they've done is said, well actually on the basis of this information, we take the MRI scans of patients with Parkinson's disease and different levels of chronic impairment. This is Parkinson's disease without chronic impairment. This is Parkinson's disease with NCI, which is mild cognitive impairment. That means you have a bit of memory problems, but not much. And then Parkinson's disease with dementia. Dementia means memory loss plus other two cognitive deficits. That could be language, visual, visual attention, orientation, whatever. But this is dementia. And they map these white matter lesions onto these atoms. What they found is actually if you do that, you see that the skin as you kind of a white matter lesions on the cholinergic pathways are a risk factor for dementia and Parkinson's disease. And there is a correlation not only between the chip score and most symptoms, but also between chip scores and sort of the, the current impairment. So, in other words, to, well actually I should take this, I mean, in other words, in order to have, so you, you have Parkinson's disease because you have a degeneration of the, uh, of the substantia nigra uh, that projected here, and you can have degenerations along this that would eventually affect the cortex, or you may have white matter damage that actually affects either the thalamic projections or these ones. So disruptions of the system can occur at different levels. Okay? Now, and that is the correlation between uh, cognitive functions and chip scale, which is particularly important for um, the attentions and some executive functions. Now, so ideally, what would you like to do? You would like to dissect out in the living human brain this cortical, subcortical nuclei that actually have been suggested to underline different functions, like uh, kind of a behavior like a Boolean pattern, uh, accusations behavior, or these executive functions. So it's being proposed that actually different loops have different functions. So ideally you would like to dissect, to dissect out this path, this, this loop in the living human brain and worked out the damage to those pathways. One way of doing that is using diffusion tensor imaging, like this way you calculate the diffusion of water molecules and the cortex will come up like a tensor where the diffusion is uh, the same in all the directions. But if you, are, am I wasting my time? Do you know about diffusion? Who? Is he, is he the only one that doesn't know about diffusion? Do you know about diffusion? No? Okay. So, probably I should go slower. Diffusion tensor imaging cartography <laughs> is a um, is a technique, an MRI technique, that allows you to quantify the diffusion of water molecules in the brain. Okay? And what you do is you calculate how the water diffuses in different directions. So if you have a cube, a voxel in the brain, where the diffusion is the same in all directions, like in this case, then uh, you reconstruct the three-dimensional representation of this diffusivity, which would be a sphere, that's telling you that, that the water diffuses the same way in all the directions. But if you take what matter, where actually the fibers are all parallel, of course uh, the membranes and myelin represent, would hinder, would constrain the diffusivity. So the diffusivity of water molecules would be greater on a 
in a, along a direction which is parallel to the directions of the fiber. So the tensor that you instruct would have a major axis. Now, if you visualize this axis, this principal eigenvector, for each single voxel, then you can work out the directions of this that the line white matter. Like in this case, this is a splitting of corpuscular. You would see this is a left and right directions of fibers, then this going down, forward, and backwards. Now, if you piece them all together, either with a pen or with a photography algorithm, better with a photography algorithm, you can reconstruct the pathway in the linear brain. And what you can do actually, you can reconstruct these connections, you can measure the volume occupied by the streamline, you can look at how this, the anatomical features of this pathway is correlated with behavior, like in this case. So, that is my last journey through this system. I tried to dissect out these pathways. So, is it possible to look at these small pathways? Yes. So, this is from a, a kind of a So, this is from Sustanza Nigra. Do you see that? It's the Sustanza Nigra over there. The black one, quite really visible, to the striatum. Particularly cool of it. Sorry, that over there. Where you see the tama and the cool of Now, so that is visible. A few streamlines, not many, but that's visible. The second the limb of the of the circuit is from the striatum to the thalamus. We can see that with tractography, and this is a big figure. Okay, from the thalamus to the striatum. The problem with that is actually the tractography will merge, will put all together different small tracks. So it would be impossible to differentiate the single ones. So we'll blend all together as a single streamline, but we know that this is not a direct pathway. And finally, the last one, we know that's possible. These are thalamic cortical projections, and they go to motor motor, go to thalamus, to dorsal prefrontal, and they go to orbital frontal. So, That would explain why, for example, when even if you don't have Parkinson's disease, but your striatum or your substanza nigra is normal, if you have some sort of atrophy of the cortex, where this either the cortical spina but also the motor, the, the thalamus motor projections go to, you have bradykinesia and gait disturbances. So you don't have Parkinson's is that you don't have tremors, but you have at least one of the symptoms that is similar to Parkinson's, and in this case because the, the cortex where this thalamic projection projects it goes to is actually atrophic, is getting older. And also, there are the reasons why they have it, they might have language problem, like reduced fluency, that is another typical example of uh, language problem in Parkinson's disease is because there is an atrophy of the regions that are important for language. So in Parkinson's disease, when the, the generation affects this uh, kind of dorsal lateral, but also ventral lateral prefrontal, uh, pre premotor prefrontal cortex, you might have language problems. And finally, when the when the Parkinson's disease affects areas the orbit from the cortex, where, for example, the onset projects to, you might actually have behavioral problems, uh, frontal, frontal behavioral type. So, I think that is my conclusion. So, 
Um, classical functional anatomy of Parkinson's disease consists of a, a degeneration, so the substantia nigra, with dopaminergic deficit and with motor symptoms. Nowadays, we understand the Parkinson's disease in a different way. We know that actually the substantia nigra and the striatum are parts of the loop where actually also the cortex is involved. And in Parkinson's disease, you have motor symptoms and cognitive behavioral symptoms that are related A to spreading of the degenerations from the substantia nigra to the rest of the circuit, or lesions that directly affecting the connections. Uh, this is sort of a current state of the art. We use neuroimaging to exclude say, other causes of, of uh, Parkinson symptoms. We look at why that lesions in case the Parkinson patients have a cognitive deficit. We also do now SPECT and PET because that is important to predict uh, consequences and complications like psychosis and cognitive impairment. Cognitive, we're not doing that, and this is the future perhaps, and the future we'll be able to do tractography or outdoor space so that we are able to um, see selectively which one of these loops are affected. I think that's it.